All right, this is the second hour of Physics 1C for May 25th. And now we're going to be talking about power in AC circuits. All right. So now that we have an expression for voltage as a function of time and current as a function of time, we can talk about how power works in an AC circuit. So in general, we know that power, when we're talking about DC circuits, was equal to the current flow multiplied by the voltage. And um, hopefully this makes some kind of sense, because if you look at the units of what these things represent, right? Uh, current flows is in coulombs per second, the number of charges per second that are flowing through a circuit. And every time a charge flows through a potential difference, it gains or loses energy. So the voltage represents the amount of energy gained or lost divided by the charge. So if you know the rate at which the charges are flowing and you multiply by the amount of energy per charge, then you're gonna get joules per second, which is power, right? Or watts. So if we want to apply this to AC circuits, then we're basically going to have to change this to I as a function of time multiplied by V as a function of time. Now, if we do that, what we're going to get is something like this. The power is going to be equal to I of T, we said we could write down as the maximum current flowing through our circuit multiplied by the cosine of omega T. And then for the voltage, it was V, what we call Vs basically, multiplied by the cosine of omega t plus whatever the phase angle happens to be. Keeping in mind that the phase angle could be positive or negative, but I'm just going to write it as plus phi right here, and we'll just say in general like plus or minus. All right. So pulling the i and the v to the front, what we end up having is cosine of omega t multiplied by this quantity right here. And what we can do for that is we can use one of our double angle formulas, not double angle, but one of the sum and difference formulas where cosine of a plus b is equal to, I'm going to write down what I think this is, and uh, we'll check it real quick. I think this is the one that's cosine of a sine of b plus sine of a cosine of b. Does that sound right? It should be cosine a cosine b minus sine a sine b. Really? Okay. Because, like, the double angle of cosine of 2a is... Mm, gotcha. It has cosine the cosine squared. squared. It's a good way of remembering that. Absolutely. So it's cosine a cosine b minus sine of a sine of b. I don't know. Like you say, if you let a equal b, you get cosine squared minus sine squared, which is what cosine of 2a would be equal to. Yeah, okay. Way. So then that means we can break up cosine of omega t plus phi and write it like this. This will be cos omega t cos phi plus sine, no, no, we're, we're minus now, minus the sine of omega t times the sine of phi. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the cosine back in through this. So our first term is going to be cos squared omega t times the cosine of phi minus so now it's important to understand that what we've written down is the power as a function of time and just like uh oh, we, we need a cosine oh the cosine phi for the last term right yeah sorry this last term isn't going to matter it's going to disappear so i guess i'm a little okay sloppy, but you're absolutely right. There is a cosine phi term right there that I left off. Okay, now, this is the power as a function of time, right? And I suppose it's possible, I guess if phi was equal to zero, for example, let's say we let phi equal to zero and look at what happens to this initial function that we had here. Um, when phi is equal to zero, this becomes a cosine squared function. And that means that um, our current as a function of time is going to follow like what a cosine squared function looks like. And a cosine squared function, I believe, looks something like something like this, right? So the power output is always positive. That's great. 
Um, but there's times when the power drops to zero, right? And, you know, in physics, uh, when we have systems like this that are, that are oscillating through time, often what we want to do is we want to talk about the average power that's actually put out, right? So um, if we want to talk about the average power, then what we need to do is we need to average this entire function here. We want to average both sides of this function over, really want to average it over one period or over multiple periods or over infinite periods, whatever you want to do. So we're looking at um, what these quantities are going to be when we average them over one period. And when we look at this term right here, this term has a sine omega t, and then it has a sine phi and a cosine phi. Now, sine phi cosine phi is going to be a number, right? It's going to be some number. It's going to be like 0.7 times 0.4 or something like that. And it's just going to be some quantity. So we don't really care about that. All we really need to worry about is what happens to the sine function over time. Okay? And when we when we time average the sine function, what do we get? Zero. Yeah, we get zero. So this entire term is going to be zero. And if you don't remember why that's the case, um, just to briefly refresh it, if I take a sine function and I plot it, so I plot a sine function, right? It's going to look something like this. It's going to go from zero up and then back down like this. Now, if I want to average what the value of this function is over one period, this would be one period right here, right? Then this function has half of its um, value positive and half of its value negative, which means that uh, when you sum over one period on average, you're going to get zero, basically. Right? And there's all kinds of ways that you can think about this. You could, for example, take 100 different data points along this curve, right? Take 100 data points, equally spaced in time, and sum them all up, and then divide by 100, you'll get zero. You could take two data points, like this data point here and this data point here, and, you know, one plus negative one is zero. So when you divide by two, you're gonna get zero. It doesn't matter how many points you pick, you will always get zero when you average this function over one period and you make the intervals of the average that, you, that you're taking uh, like, you know, equal to each other. You always get zero. But for cosine squared, that won't happen because it's a squared function. So it's always positive. And what you get when you average this one, this is something we did at the beginning of class last time. Now it's been a long time. What do you get when you average this function over one period? Do you remember? It should be one half. You get a half, right? And again, to remind you what we did to calculate what that was, we basically said, use the cosine squared of omega t. Well, cosine squared of omega t is basically equal to one half multiplied by, I think it's one minus uh, cos squared omega t, is that right? Or, no, 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 not cos, cos of two omega t, right? Is that correct? I think you can use this to prove it. But the point is that you're going to get two pieces of this thing when you do cosine squared. One piece is going to be a half, and the other piece is going to be a cosine function, which when we average this one, you get zero. So you get a half again. Okay, we did this at the beginning of class last time, so you can go back and look at a more detailed derivation of that if you want to. This may be wrong the way it's written, but it's absolutely the case that there is a half term and there is a cosine term. And now that I now that it might be wrong, I kind of want to check. What would cosine of 2a be? Cosine of 2a would be equal to cosine squared uh, a minus sine squared a. And then you want to solve for this, but you also want to replace this with uh, 1 minus cos squared, right? Yeah. And if you do that, you'll get a positive, which will add to this one, so you'll have 1, and yeah, it works out. I think you I think you do get the same answer. Okay, the point okay. is... What, what's up? Go ahead. It's fine. Go ahead. No, it doesn't matter. Is it plus? It should, yeah, it should be flipped, and then it should be 2 cosine 2 omega t. Really? When you say flipped, one of these should be positive and one should be negative, you mean? Cosine squared. Oh, no, that's cosine squared. I was looking at the double angle formula. The double angle is 2 cosine squared omega t minus 1. But that's not a double angle, that's just being squared. So this is right then. Right? 
Uh, oh, it will be positive. That is right. It, it would be a positive. Okay. All right. So what we end up getting out of this then, pretty simple result, which is that the average power in our circuit is going to be given by I times Vs what's left, divided by 2 from the half, and then there's a cosine phi sticking around right here, right? So this gives us one definition of what the average power is. I'm going to give you several more, but this is just one example of, of, of what, you can, what you can use, okay? Now, if we remember some of the things we talked about at the very beginning of class last time, we defined RMS current to be equal to um, the maximum current in the circuit divided by square root 2, and we defined VRMS to be equal to the maximum current in the, the maximum voltage in the circuit, sorry, divided by square root two. So these are both I max and V max, and it's, th these are as well. This I and this V here are, are the maximums. Okay. So given that that's the case, um, we can we can kind of rearrange this a little bit here. We can say well two is equal to root two times root two, right? So this is like I over root two multiplied by Vs over root 2, cos phi. So we could write this as the average power is equal to IRMS VRMS cosine phi. This is a pretty common way to write this. And this is why we call cosine phi the power factor. When or I should say, for what values of uh, of phi do you get the maximum amount of average power out of your circuit? Zero. Zero, right? And when is phi equal to zero? When they're in phase together. This is when, right? When XL and XC are equal to each other, you get phi equal to zero, right? So, the way I like to think about the power factor is um, when you have a circuit that's like in a phase, um, that's like pushing someone on a swing. Like you guys have all done this before at some point in your life, I assume. Maybe, maybe you haven't. I don't know. But where you're pushing someone that swings, so they're swinging back and forth, right? And if you want to push a child on a swing and want to make them go really high, what do you need to do? Well, they swing back and forth and back and forth. You want to make them go really high you got to make sure that when you push them they're on the way up already right you basically want to push them right when they're at the very bottom in order to make them keep going higher and higher and higher when you're pushing them everyone have an experience with that yeah. mm -hmm. yep. okay all right so what you could say you're doing then if you wanted to talk about it in like physics terms is the child is swinging with some frequency right maybe the child goes through one swing every second right? one full swing from here to here and back again once every second, right? So if, if the frequency of the swing is once every second, how often do you need to push them in order to make sure that they get kind of maximum increase in their swing? Twice. Huh? Twice? Oh, I'm assuming that we can only push in one direction for now, just to keep things simple. Oh, okay. So we can only push this way. How often, if, if the swing takes one full second to complete, how often do I need to be pushing? At what rate do I need? Hmm? Okay. Once per okay. second, you're okay. saying. I'm looking for a time. Yeah. How often is okay. time, right? So one time mm -hmm. every second, right? So every time that they get back to this this bottom point, and they're going this way, which will only happen once every second, because they'll also be at this bottom point but going this way once every half second, right? So once every second, they're at the bottom, and so you keep pushing them, and you keep pushing them, and they'll go higher and higher and higher. Hopefully not too high, but, you know, that's kind of the goal when you're pushing someone on a swing, right? You want to basically just input energy into the system so that they keep going higher and higher and higher. Okay. Now, when we're talking about an AC circuit, we're talking about a circuit like this. Um, we have this natural frequency at which the circuit kind of wants to oscillate, right? And when the voltage of the source is pushing at the same frequency as the natural frequency of the circuit, okay, then it's exactly the same as what happens with the, the kit on the swing. It guarantees that you're kind of the power that you're putting into the system is also coming out of the system. Does that make sense? Um, when you're pushing the child and you push them in frequency or like in in rhythm, you can call it in rhythm if you want to, then you're getting 
kind of maximum amount of the power that goes into the system is also coming right back out of the system, right? The power that you put in from your pushing is going directly into the child as they go higher and higher and higher, right? Now, let's reverse that and see what would happen if we did exactly the opposite, right? So suppose you have a child that's swinging back and forth on a swing, and now your goal is to basically make them stop swinging, right? What you would do is exactly the opposite of what you did before, right? What you would do is every time they swing down to here, you would push this way, right? Do you all agree with that? Mm -hmm. And if you did that, basically all the energy that you would put into the system would basically immediately be lost because you weren't doing it kind of at the proper rate. You weren't doing it in phase with the child swinging, right? So that's pretty much what the phase angle is doing. When the phase angle is out of phase, like let's say the phase angle was, the previous problem was like 53 degrees or 0.93 radians. That means that the pushing that's happening, which in the circuit, it's, it's the, the source is doing the pushing. Um, it's not super energy efficient, right? It's not super energy efficient. So if you, if you, if you say you have a, a phi equal to zero, that's basically the same thing as pushing the kid every time right at the bottom. That means that when the current is flowing to the left, the voltage of the source is pushing it to the left. When the current is flowing to the right, the voltage of the source is pushing it to the right, okay? So it's like the current wants to, it's already going this way and the, the source basically keeps it going that way. And then when it's ready to go back the other way, the source is already ready to push it back the other way. Does that make sense? So this is more like what, I think what you all were thinking, which was you push the child when they go this way, but then when they come back down, you also push them back the other way. That's what phi equals zero represents. It represents you're always continuously pushing the child exactly with the direction that they're going. So the moment they turn around, you start pushing them back the other way, right? Does that make sense? Or is that a massive over explanation? That makes sense. That makes sense. Yep. Okay. So that's what we call it the power factor. It has something to do with efficiency too. So when phi is equal to zero, you're going to have a really efficient system. Um, energy efficient. Okay, so what are some other ways that we can, that we can describe um, power? Well, we can go back to our definition of what cosine phi was. So cosine phi, we said, can be defined as, I think it was R over Z, right? True. Yeah, R over Z. And again, you can kind of look at this picture and be like, okay, it's, it's VR over VC, VS, which is R over Z. So if we use that definition, we can come back here and say, well then, our average power is gonna be equal to IRMS times, what's VRMS equal to? Well, VRMS is actually gonna be equal to Vmax over root two, but it's also, according to one of our equations from before, we said that the voltage of the source was equal to I times Z, right? But these were both um, maximum values. It's also true that if I write down the RMS voltage, that this is gonna be equal to I RMS times Z, because to get from this equation down to this equation, all I need to do is divide by root two, according to these two definitions right here, right? So if I divide both sides by root two, I get this. So that also means that IRMS and VR, so VRMS is equal to, I'm replacing it right here, IRMS multiplied by Z. And why am I all of a sudden talking about RMS voltages here? Well, the reason why is because these are the things that we measure with our instruments. When we use a multimeter or something like that to measure a voltage in a circuit or to measure a current in a circuit, because the, the voltage is doing this and the current is doing this, they're oscillating. It doesn't make much sense to define what the current at a moment in time is. It makes more sense to talk about the RMS current. So this is these are the things we measure. Okay, we replace VRMS with IRMS Z, and we replace cosine phi with R over Z, and our answer becomes extremely simple. We get the average power in our circuit is the RMS current, again, this is what we measure, squared multiplied by R. And if you go back to DC circuits, this is exactly the definition we got when we were talking about DC circuits, right? It was that uh, in a DC circuit, the power was just I squared R. So a reasonable question to ask at this point would be to say, why does the inductor and the capacitor not show up in this final expression right here? You could argue that in this definition for the average power, IRMS, VRMS, cosine phi, Cosine phi carries some information about XL and XC inside of it. Even though you don't see inductance, you don't see capacitance show up in this equation, cosine phi carries information about those things, right? 
but it turns out that when you plug in for what cosine phi is, and then you replace this, the z's cancel, the phi is gone, and your final answer just is i squared r, basically. Which seems to imply that the only thing that's really doing anything in terms of power in the circuit is the resistor, basically. So, why would that be the case? Why is it only the resistor that ends up showing up in this equation? Because the resistor dissipates energy, and then power is just the rate of change of energy, right? The dissipator uh, dissipates energy, that's correct. Now, can an inductor store energy? Can I, let's start with a capacitor, because this capacitor is probably the simplest. Can a capacitor store energy inside of it? Yeah. Can it yep. dissipate energy too? Can it, can it, can it deliver energy to the circuit? Mm-hmm. It can. So why is it that the, the capacitor didn't show up then? Yeah, that is interesting. What do you all think? Why is the capacitor not showing up in here? So just to emphasize what I was trying to say, we take an AC circuit and, um, you know, we put a capacitor inside of it, including, you know, a resistor. We have our inductor as well. And let's think about what the capacitor does over one cycle, okay? So over one cycle, the capacitor is probably going to charge up positive, right? So it's going to be mm -hmm. storing energy, right? And I would say at that point, it's basically sapping power from the system. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. It's because it's on average. Uh, right. Drains and then yeah, yeah. drains, gains, drains, gains. That's exactly right. So what's happening over one cycle, we always have to think about one cycle. You know, when we talk about the average here, we're talking about one cycle. So when we talk about what's happening with the capacitor and the circuit, over one cycle, what happens is it charges up and then it decharges, discharges. It charges up and then it discharges. And that's what it does. So that means that half the time the capacitor is absorbing energy from the circuit, and half the time the capacitor is delivering energy to the circuit. And because the capacitor is treated as kind of like an ideal circuit element, meaning that it doesn't have any internal resistance to it itself, which is kind of ridiculous, real capacitors do have some resistance, um, there's no way for that energy to be dissipated from the system. So it, it stores energy and then it delivers energy. So sometimes the power going to the capacitor is positive, Sometimes it's negative. And the same thing can be true for the inductor. What the inductor does is it builds up current, and when the current is fully built up inside of it, it has a magnetic field that stores magnetic energy. And then that magnetic energy is going to decay as the current decays. So the same thing with the inductor. It is either storing magnetic energy or it's delivering magnetic energy, which means the power from the inductor is either positive or it's negative. Um, and on average, as you said, Cam, that means that it's going to be it's going to be zero. So it's only the resistor that regardless of if the current flows left or right, the resistor is always going to be sapping energy from your circuit, right? So, you know, imagine that I, I always like to just think of a resistor as just being a light bulb because I think that helps. So if we just replace our resistor right here with a light bulb, right? And then here's our little filament. What this means is that the energy from the source has to constantly be pumping energy into the system in order to keep the light bulb lit. Right? The moment that the current stops flowing, the light bulb is not going to be lit anymore, right? So the light bulb ends up being the one thing that this, the, basically it's like the, the source has to deliver enough energy to keep the light bulb lit. That's kind of what this equation says to me. But the other two objects will basically act as kind of like reservoirs for energy. Um, this one can store energy and then it can give it right back. The same way that if I throw an object up in the air, it eventually comes right back down to, to where, it, where it was, right? Because gravity is giving me the energy I need to go from here up to here and then back down again, right? Gravity takes energy away on the way up, and then it gives you energy on the way down. Does that all make sense, everybody? It's a really nice, simple result. I squared R. That's all you have. But keep in mind that there is this thing hiding in the background. Um, Sometimes you're going to need to use this equation to solve problems with power. I know for a fact that at least one of your lab manual problems is like that, and at least one of your homework problems that you're going to need this equation, so just keep that in mind. But uh, I think that basically covers AC circuits in terms of their, like, the equations we need to, to talk about them. Um, and the only other thing to do now is to basically talk about resonance, um, which we almost kind of just did in a way. So let's do this real quick. Let's do this it's a really simple problem, but it doesn't hurt to do simple things. 
So we have an electric hair dryer that's rated at 1500 watts, and now we can say this is the average power uh, at 120 volts, which is the RMS voltage. We want to calculate the resistance, the RMS current, and the maximum instantaneous power. We're going to assume that the dryer is a pure resistor, the heating element access resistor. Okay, so what we have here is we know average power is 1500 watts. We know that the RMS voltage is 120 volts. And we want to find A, what is the resistance? So to calculate our resistance, what should we do? We could, we could just use the equation right above. Which one? Or, well, we're going to need the, it looks like the, the first one, IRMS, VRMS. How are we going to find cosine phi? Yeah, about that. What do you all think? What can we do here? What does this mean? Assume that the dryer is a pure resistor. What does that mean? I mean, it, it's just acting like a resistor. So we could like replace dryer with just like, it's just a resistor. Mm -hmm. So what would the- Is that what I mean by pure resistor? So what would the inductance be in this case then? What would the capacitance be in this case? Are they all zero? They're all zero, exactly. That's what they're saying. They're saying that L is equal to zero and C is equal to zero, which also means that phi is equal to zero. Because when these are equal to each other, then phi is zero, right? Okay, well, that makes it really simple then. Because now what we can do is we can use this equation up here to find what IRMS is and that we just go from there basically. It's also the case now, we, we can even, there's all kinds of things we can do here. If phi is zero, that also means that the impedance is equal to R, right? So, we'll just use this equation. So we're gonna have power average is equal to IRMS, VRMS, times cos phi, but cosine phi is gonna be equal to one. That means IRMS is equal to the average power divided by VRMS. So this is gonna be equal to fifteen hundred over one twenty. So I get twelve point five. And then if I want to find the resistance, I can basically say that power average divided by IRMS squared is equal to the resistance. So the average power is 1500 watts. We divide by, oh, you know what? Current is not measured in volts. I'm sorry about that. This should have been in amps. So 1500 watts divided by IRMS, which is, we just calculated 12.5 squared. Nine point six. Yep, I agree. So I get nine point six ohms. That's our resistance R. That's part A. Um, part B. We want to calculate the R. Well, we already did it. <laughs> Twelve point five. And then part C, uh, the maximum instantaneous power. So for maximum instantaneous power.
it would just be I Z, not I R M S. Well, so it would be root two I R M S. That's what I think it's going to be, something like that. How do you find the maximum power? So this is the instantaneous power, right? Right, right. And we know what i is, and we know what this is. So it's going to be i squared r times all of those. Oh, but phi is zero. That's key. So if phi is zero, then it's just going to be i max times v max, right? Mm -hmm. I'll just we'll come down here. I'll just I'll start from this equation. So that's our instantaneous power equation. And since phi is zero, this becomes just i times vs times cosine squared of omega t. But the maximum value of cosine squared of omega t is going to be one. So your maximum power output is going to be equal to basically just i times vs, which is going to be equal to, so i is, so this was i rms right here. So if I want to get maximum voltage, I need to do root two times i rms. That's what i is going to be equal to, and then root 2 times vrms, both of which were given. So we're going to get 2 times irms, which was 12.5 amps, and we multiply by vrms, which is given as 120 volts. So we get 20. 25 times 120 would be, I don't know, I'm not feeling like doing it in my head, 3,000. That should have been pretty easy to do that. 3,000 watts. Which is double the average. Yeah. That makes sense. Kind of see it from this equation, too. And there we go. Anyone have any questions? Can you go over uh, once more how the cosine squared, how you can change, change that to the root two I, IRMS? Oh, 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 here? Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. So all I did was say, if I want to go to the maximum power, mm -hmm. I just need the maximum value of this function. Oh, gotcha, okay. Which is one, yeah. All right, so final topic. Um, go ahead, what's up? And when it says pure, and something is like just pure resistor, then we can, we can say the inductance is zero and... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, let's talk. I, I really want to do... Let's just see what time we have after we talk about... Um, after we talk about resonance. We'll see what time we have left to... Um, I'd like to do another problem with power, basically. Because I think that one's just a little bit too easy. So if we have some time left over at the end, I'm going to go over that. Okay. So, resonance. Resonance is a very important phenomenon, not just in physics, but in all of science, really. Um... And it's kind of naturally shows up in these AC circuits. So let's look at our equation for current flowing in an AC circuit. So our equation is really simple, and it's also kind of deceptively complicated. So the current is equal to the voltage divided by the impedance, right? But we said that the impedance was equal to And XL and XC are both related to the angular frequency in your circuit. So,
if we write this all out completely, x sub l is equal to uh, omega times l, and x sub c is equal to 1 divided by omega c. So now what we can do is we can say, we could plot, if we wanted to, for a given value of voltage, resistance, L and C. So if we pick V, R, L and C to all be constants, then we can plot basically the current as a function of the angular frequency, right? And when you look at this function, there's going to be a natural place where you're going to get a peak in the function, right? Because this is a, it's a fraction and fractions are the biggest when the denominator is the smallest, right? And the way to make the denominator the smallest in this case is to basically set this piece right here equal to zero, right? This is gonna lead to basically your maximum current output. I don't wanna call it I max, it's basically gonna be, this is gonna lead to I omega, I of omega being um, maximum. Right? That's, does that make sense to everybody? That as long as this term is as small as possible, it's going to make I of omega the maximum? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what value actually makes this equal to zero? Well, if we set it equal to zero, omega sub L minus one over omega C, we set that equal to zero, what we're going to get is omega L is equal to one over omega C, which means that omega squared is equal to one over LC, which means that omega is equal to, I'm gonna call this omega naught, um, the square root of one over LC. We call this the natural frequency or the resonance frequency. Because at that frequency, you're going to get a maximum kind of like spike in your, um, in your current. So what does that look like? Well, if we plot it, Here's an example of what this looks like if we plot it for these values. So we take V equal to 100, L is equal to 2, C is equal to half a microfarad, and then three different values for the resistance. So we have uh, the bottom one is 2,000 ohms, and then 5,000 ohms, and then 2,000 ohms, okay? Or sorry, 2,500, 200, right? What happens is we get curves that look, look, look like this, basically. So it's, when you look at the 200 ohm one, it's very, very noticeable. You get a massive spike in the frequency right here, Uh, when you're right at the um, the resonant frequency. And you can see what that is in this case because L is picked to be 2 Henry and C is picked to be 0.5 microfarads. So if we calculate this in that case, what would omega naught be? So omega naught is going to be equal to 1 over the square root of L. L is 2 multiplied by 0.5 microfarads. So 0.5 times 10 to the minus 6 farads. Let me square root it. I'm pretty sure you're going to get 1,000, I guess, because this is going to be 2 times 0.5 is just 1. So we're basically taking the square root of a, of a millionth, which is like the square root of a million in the numerator, which is going to be 1,000. So what does this mean? This means that when you have... Um, the angular frequency of your circuit set to this quantity, you're going to get a maximum output power. So, does that make sense? Maybe I should just stop right there. Does this, does this automatically make sense to you all or do I need to explain more? More time. So, Think of the angular frequency as a control. Think of it as a dial that you can manipulate. Okay, and when you and let's let's just look at the 200 ohm circuit. Okay, the one that's like gray right here. Whenever you whenever you crank your frequency in your circuit to 500 radians per second, your output current is kind of low. Right, it's a uh, looks like about 0.3 amps. Right, but then when you start to crank up the frequency in your circuit and you get up to a thousand, all of a sudden 
your current has massively increased by a factor of, I don't know if it's 0.03 down here and it's 0.5 now. It's much, much higher. So how would that, um, how can we visualize this? Well, what would happen is um, if you had, for example, a light bulb in your circuit and you had all the lights in your room turned off, what you'd notice is um, that uh, right when you get to 1,000, the light bulb is going to get really, really bright, but then when you start to increase the frequency higher, it's going to fall off lower and it's going to start to get dim again. So the light bulb will be dim over here, it'll be dim over here, but then it's going to be really bright when you're in this region, right? Another application of this is the way radios work, and I guess the, the next problem we're going to do is about this, but in order to tune into a radio station, you have a dial on your radio, right? And what do you do when you manipulate that dial on your radio? Now, nowadays, it's probably going to be like some kind of a digital radio, right? So it, on a digital radio, you can basically like, let's say you're scrolling up through um, the, um, the stations on your radio, right? When you tune into a station, right? Um, like, let's say you tune into the NPR station, which is 89.3. This number represents, does anyone know what it represents? Frequency, right? It's a frequency, right? And it's given in megahertz, right? Megahertz. Yeah. So, on your radio, when you set your radio to this frequency, right, what you're doing is you're trying to kind of hone in on a station, right? You're trying to find the signal for the station. But when you're on, if you, if you tune your radio slightly below this, or you tune your radio slightly above this, right? It's gonna sound like what? What does it sound like when you, when you go slightly below? Realistically, radios don't go like in these single digits, but if you, um, it sounds like static, exactly, is there. When you're off of the frequency of the station, it sounds like static. It's like you can't hear over the background noise. That's what static is at the end of the day, right? It's 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 you're hearing. Static is basically the the interference of all of the different radio signals that are permeating the air, right? You're hearing all of them at the same time, and what that sounds like to us is static. Okay. It's just like a whole bunch of people talking at the exact same time, right? You you can't make out a, a voice, right? But if you, let, let's say you're in a let's say you're at a really big party. And there's hundreds of people at this party. You're all in some, some big uh, venue or something like that, right? And you want to hear someone talking to you, right? You have to basically, like, stand very close to them, and you probably have to focus really carefully on what they're saying if you want to hear what they're saying, right? So that act of, like, trying to listen to one person out of a crowd of people is very similar to trying to tune into a radio station. When you tune in right on the station, notice what happens with this curve. So now the current that's flowing through your circuit is going to massively increase uh, when you get to that point. And the effect of that's gonna be, you're gonna hear that station over the other stations, basically. Because your radio is going to basically act just like this curve acts. But what you'd be plotting more likely is kind of the power output from the radio, which is gonna be related to the current, right? But when you tune right in, you can distinguish that one signal because the circuit will massively amplify the power uh, of that signal because you're tuned right into it, you know? And when it massively amplifies the power of one signal over the others, you can hear it over the others. Does that make any sense? I don't think I really explained that very well. No, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, you were trying to plot something on Desmos um, and that works. Um, we can do that if you want to. We can go to, uh, just to kind of see um, how this works. I'm going to use Wolfram Alpha. That's okay. You guys really like Desmos, though, huh? <laughs> Desmos is... It's, it's pretty good? Oh, yeah. Okay. So we can plot this function. Here, let's get to where we can actually see what it looks like. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not what I meant to do. So we are going to plot this function. Scroll up a little bit. All right, well, let me do it, because I need to go off of, go like this, go to Wolfram Alpha, just to kind of show that you actually do get what they say. So we want to plot this function here, right? Um, 
I'm just going to set every value to 1, and then we can change them in a second. So it's 1 divided by, in fact, then we could just basically do this. We could just basically do... So R squared, we're going to make that 1, plus omega, we use W. W times, we'll make that 1, minus 1 over W, whole squared. And then we just need to take this and put it to the negative 0.5. Actually, let's use the same values that they used, and let's see if we can we can figure out how it changes. So the values that they used in their picture were v was a hundred, so that shows up here in the front. Um, they used l equals to two, so that is this one, two times w. They used 0.5 microfarads for this one, so that's going to be one divided by that, and then divided by yes, that's right, Jacqueline, exactly. Yep. That's exactly right. It's exactly like those TVs. You're, you're, you're literally picking up an over-the-air signal, right? There's this signals in the air, and you need to tune in to get a massive, a massive power amplification, power amplification within your circuit, so that you can actually hear, and see the signal. Uh, 0.5 microfarads. What's that? Zero point one two three four. Is that right? This would be. If it was here, it'd be five times to the negative six. But this is 0.5 times to the negative six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then what else do we have? That's it, right? 100. So here's our voltage. Oh, resistance. There's three different values of resistance, so we can plot this. Let's use the 200 one. Let's see. Let's see if we actually get the curve that they they have here, because I often think that textbooks can kind of lie to you. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. It's not quite right, is it? Five times to the negative seven. That's right. Oh, you know what? I, wait, it, it is doing W, right? Yeah, it's Y versus W. Huh. Oh, the Y axis is super small. That's what that would do. Is that what's doing it? You're basically looking at very, very closely to the origin. Yeah. You can look at on the photo. Yeah, the scale is super yeah, it looks tiny. Like a, it makes it look like a line. Yeah, we kind of off back a factor of like, what, 10, 100? So we need to go, okay, we need to get from zero to a thousand, right? So that's easy to fix. All we have to do on this then is just put, put a range. I think the way you do this is zero comma w comma. No, I think it's like, I think it's w comma zero comma. We want to go to 2000, let's say. So that should give us a domain. I did it right. Yeah, there we go. There we go. And the Y is not quite going high enough, but that's fine. That's what it looks like, though, right? There is definitely a peak. Definitely a peak. And what we can do is we can we can manipulate the frequency here and show that if we make this, for example, let's say 500, it should lower the peak. <laughs> Maybe it does. We can't really tell. <laughs> anyway, so... Um, yeah, that's resonance. Um, so resonance shows up not just in these kind of circuits like this, right? But it shows up all over physics. Like a resonant effect occurs any time that you have a function that is, you know, like this, where you have something in the denominator and you're trying to figure out how do I maximize the quantity on the left? And it's always going to be by making the denominator as small as possible. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of effects like this that happen. Um, I gave you an example of one. When you push a child in the swing, that's an example of resonance, right? When you want to make them go higher and higher and higher. Uh, the example that Jacqueline gave of tuning a TV, very similar. You experience this all the time when you tune into a Wi-Fi signal, right? Um, you know, if you live, like I do, in an apartment complex, there are a lot of Wi-Fi signals around me, right? And if all of those different Wi-Fi signals were interfering with each other, then, like, while I'm watching an NBA game and my neighbors were watching Netflix, you know, we you might see some interference there. But the amazing thing about these, um, about resonance is, you know, I can, we can both be um, using Wi-Fi in the same area, but their Wi-Fi is using a different frequency than my, my Wi-Fi, right? And even if those frequencies are off by just a little bit, um, I mean, look how fast this curve turns over, right? I mean, if you're at a frequency of, like, 950 hertz, you're way lower. So if I'm watching, so, so that makes it so that my Wi-Fi isn't interfering with my neighbor's Wi-Fi, right? Um, in the type of research that I did, um, we were looking and trying to produce um, particles at these particle colliders 
And it turns out that the production rate for certain particles goes way up when you make it so that the energy of the incoming particles... So just to repeat or kind of like summarize what I was talking about. In the experiments I was doing, what we were doing was taking very energetic particle here, very energetic particle here, you collide them together, and then out of that, some, some stuff comes out, right? It turns out that if you want to produce a certain particle, for example, at, at, at the LHC, they're trying to produce Higgs bosons. So if you want to guarantee that you get a bunch of Higgs bosons, the Higgs boson has a mass of about 125 GeV. The unit's not important, it's 125, right? So it turns out that if you make it so that your energy of the, of the input products is um, extremely close to the mass of that particle, then the production rate of the particle goes drastically up, like by a huge, huge amount, exactly like this. And it's one of the only ways that we can even probe and find particles uh, is by tuning our collider to the right energy level to produce that particle, right? Um, yeah, that's... Uh, that's just an example of you know where I use it in my own research. So these type of phenomena occur in nature all the time. These type of resonant phenomenon, uh, and we can exploit them in physics and in other fields to uh, to find things. Uh, an example of where you use this in chemistry, I believe, is something called an NMR machine. You, you, I think a lot of you have used something like that probably before in uh, in your chemistry class. That stands for nuclear magnetic resonance, I think, something like that. But the R is resonance. Uh, in an MRI machine, the R stands for resonance. Um, so it's a very, very important um, thing that shows up, not just in physics, but really in all scientific uh, fields, probably in all kinds of fields, honestly. Okay, resonance. Resonance is really fascinating. I was, I was utterly shocked at how frequently it showed up whenever I was studying physics. Okay, so let's look at this problem right here that we want to solve. It says the series circuit is similar to some radio tuning circuits. Uh, it is connected to a variable... Oh, I left something out completely here. We want this to be equal to zero, right? This quantity. And I said that happens when your, your the frequency that you tune the circuit to is equal to this. It happens to be the case when you do that, that XL and XC are equal to each other. That's one thing that I left out. Basically, you want these things to be equal to each other. And there's two different ways you can do that. One way is by manipulating L and C for a given value of frequency, or... For a given L and C, you can just change the frequency of your circuit. Which is quite easy to do by turning a knob. I noticed someone else mentioned, is there, you use a FM transmitter for your car so you can like listen to your your phone or your iPod, whatever, right? And uh, yeah, I, did, I used the same thing for a long time. And yeah, you just use a static channel because it won't interfere, right? You use some channel where there's, there's no information coming through. Um, yeah, my car is also outdated. My car is from 2004, so, which really means it's from 2003. So all I have is a, um, what does it have? It has, I have like a tape deck and I have a, no, I don't have a tape deck. I just have, I just have a CD player, which is pretty, pretty antiquated. Okay. Uh, tuning a radio 31.8. Okay. So the series circuit in figure 31.20 is similar to some radio tuning circuits. It is connected to a variable variable frequency AC source. This means that it's a source where you can manipulate the frequency. If, if we were doing uh, labs in this class, you would have seen these kind of things. In fact, one of the things we would have done in the lab this semester is that we would have actually reproduced this plot. That's a really fun lab. And by fun, I mean it's like, it's really tedious, but I like it. Okay, so here's our circuit. Um, it looks like we know things like what the current is. We know the resistance, the inductance, the capacitance. Um, we want to find the resonant frequency. Uh, at the resonant frequency, we want to find the inductive reactance, the capacitive reactance, and the impedance. And then we want to find the RMS current, IRMS, the RMS voltage. Okay. Once again, this is going to involve just plugging and chugging, basically. So let's go through this. In case you can't read these numbers here, it says that R is equal to 500 ohms. The inductance L is equal to 0 0.4 millihenry. And the capacitance is equal to 100 picofarads just to write what these are. So 0.4 millihenry will be 0 0.0004 henry. And 100 picofarads will be 100 times 10 to the negative 12, I think. Nano is negative nine, pico is negative 12, yeah. Okay, so part A, 
find the resonant frequency, omega naught. Well, omega naught is equal to the square root of one over LC. So one over the square root of 0 0.004 Henry. Oops, one more, one more zero. Multiplied by 100 times 10 to the negative 12 farads. Okay, we calculate what this is. Five to the sixth. I got that too. Okay. I clearly did this wrong, right? Yep, I agree, five million, right? Okay, so, so this is our angular frequency is five times 10 to the sixth uh, radians per second. Part B, find the inductive reactants XL, the capacitive reactants XC, and the impedance. Um, I'm pretty sure I can say pretty confidently the impedance is going to be equal to 500 here, but let's see. So X of L is equal to omega times L, and it's going to be omega naught that we just calculated, so that's going to be 5 times 10 to the 6th radians per second multiplied by uh, 0.0004, which is 4 times 10 to the negative 4. So that would be negative 4. About 2,000. Yeah, I agree. Pretty sure you can get the exact same answer for XC. You almost have to. That's the whole point of doing this. So now XC should be equal to 1 over omega naught times C. So that's going to be equal to 1 over 5 times 10 to the 6th multiplied by 100 times 10 to the negative 12. Okay, so this is like. 1 times 10 to the negative 10, 6 minus 10 is negative 4, 5 times 10 to the negative 4 is equal to, 1 over that would be 2,000. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. They have to be the same, because if you're at the natural frequency, they, they're equal to each other. That's the whole point. Okay. Impedance is defined as the square root of R squared plus XL minus XC whole squared. So since XL and XC are equal to each other, this means this whole term is zero, which means Z is equal to R and R was equal to 500. Uh, that was that, part C. The RMS current, IRMS, well, IRMS is equal to VRMS divided by Z. So it's going to be the RMS voltage. It says the RMS terminal voltage is 1 volt. So this is going to be 1 volt divided by Z, which is equal to, oh, whoops. It's 500, so this is Z. So 1 volt over 500 ohms is going to be equal to, I don't know, 0 0.002 or something like that, maybe? That seems right. Is that right? Oh, look, it's right there in the problem. Okay. D. Uh, the RMS voltage across each circuit element. I think it's already been solved for us here. But just to go through how that's done... Uh, if I want to find the RMS voltage across the um, uh, the resistor, I just take the RMS current and I multiply by the resistance. If I want to find VL, I do IRMS and I multiply by XL. And if I want to do VC, I do IRMS times XC. So we get I times R here. So what's the I that we'll put on these? So it's 2 milliamps for all these. So it's 0 0.002 amp. When I'm doing problems like these, it really reminds me of, um, you know, like when you're in elementary school and you do something wrong and the teacher tells you to go to the board and to like, 
or I don't know. If they, I don't, do they still do this? I don't know if they do this. They used to make us go to the, the go to the board and 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 write a sentence like over and over and over and over again. Do you guys have to do that when you're? No, I no? think something in the movies. Yeah, I think Bart Simpson. <laughs> Yeah, yeah exactly. Bart Simpson at the beginning of The Simpsons, right? He's always writing those things, right? Like teachers used to yeah. do that. Teachers used to do that shit. Like they used to. I, I it happened to me a lot. I, I, I acted a lot in class, and uh, it just I, just doing these type of problems because they're so repetitive over and over and over and over and over again just reminds me of that. Um, anyway, so IRMS times R point zero zero two amps times what's R? R is five hundred ohms. Uh, XL was two thousand. And um, XC is 2,000. So we get our answers here. I think all the answers are kind of written there. 500 times 0 0.002 is 1 volts. 2,000 times 0 0.002 should be 4 volts. And this should also be 4 volts. They called it standard. Standards, you remember those? Something like that? Yeah. So, so, so I'm not the only one to have experienced that. Anyway, so that's pretty much it. Um, that's... that's uh, um, RLC circuits. That's AC circuits. That's you know we've learned all the all the important terms and things you need to know. So we have a little bit of time left. Um, I'm tempted to stop. I, I was looking for a problem in your. Um, I was trying to find a problem from the book before class, and I was going through these problems. And I was trying to find one that said something about power factor. I didn't actually do a search. I wonder if this works. Will it actually search the thing? really slow. That's, that's not searched the entire textbook, right? That's what I think it was doing, too. I just want to search the page. I was trying to find a good problem where you have to... Oh, there it is. This is the one I want to do. Okay, I can't remember if this is actually uh, in your... I couldn't see this. I couldn't find this earlier. I don't know why. Now I found it. Under pressure. Let us do this problem, because this will definitely help you when you are doing your homework. Almost all of the um, problems you're going to see in this homework set are going to be very, very easy, probably except for this one. I can't remember if I actually assigned this one on your homework or not. I don't really care, though, because you're going to have to redo, you have to do one on uh, your, uh, one of the lab annual problems is like this, too, so. Okay, so we have an LRC series circuit that draws 220 watts. Okay, so that's going to be average power, right? 220 watts from a 120 volt. It tells you that's RMS. This is pretty standard. This is like United States 120 volts RMS. 50 hertz, that would be more like what uh, Europe uses. 50 hertz is our frequency. Now notice, again, this is like I was saying earlier, you've got to be really careful with these numbers. When they put hertz right here, that means that it's frequency, and you probably, you might you might not have to, you probably are going to have to convert this to omega, which you do by getting 2 pi times the frequency, so in this case that's going to be, what, 100 pi radians per second. Okay, so don't forget to do this. It says the power factor is 0.56, so we'll just call that PF or something. Um, and remember, the power factor is equal to what again? Cosine pi. Cosine pi. Cosine pi, exactly. Okay. Um, it also tells us that the source voltage leads the current. Does that mean that the phase angle is positive or negative? A positive. Positive, right. What does that mean in terms of XL and XC? Which one is going to be bigger? XL. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, important information. Uh, part A says, what is the net resistance of the circuit? Okay. How would we find that? What do you all think? How do we find the resistance of the circuit?
How did we define average power earlier? Like, what are the ways we define average power? One of them was I squared R. What was the other one? That one was um, <clears throat> IRMS times BRMS times cosine pi. Exactly. Now, our goal here is to find what R is, right? Our part A, the question is, what is R equal to? Okay. This obviously doesn't have R in it, but we also have the ability with this one to calculate IRMS, because we know everything else, right? So let's just do that. That sounds like a, a useful number to have. So if I do P average divided by VRMS, and then I divide by cosine phi, this allows us to calculate IRMS. So that's going to be equal to 220 over 120 times 0 0.56. 3.27 amps. Thanks. Okay, we know the RMS current now. And now I would say we can go to one of the other equations, which is power average um, is equal to I squared RMS um, times R. Divide by this, you get average power over I squared RMS is equal to R. So that's going to be 220 watts divided by 3.27 amps whole squared equals twenty point six. Sixty seven point two? Oh no, I gotta divide by that twice, right? Divide by three point two seven. Twenty point six? Yeah, twenty point six. Okay. So we got this. This is probably useful, so I'll box it in. Okay. Okay, so next thing says, this is the part that's kind of tricky. I, I find, for whatever reason, what we just did, <laughs> what we just did is not hard. It's just a matter of, like, just using the equations we have and solving for an unknown. But for whatever reason, with these type of problems, it's not always immediately obvious what you're supposed to do here. So just, if you don't know what to do, just, like, write down the equations you have and just start solving for stuff. And you'll eventually get the answer, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Part B says, find the capacitance of the series capacitor that will result in a power factor of unity when it is added to the original circuit. Find the capacitance of the series capacitor that will result in a power factor of unity when it is added to the original circuit. So this is what they are saying. Let's see if I can leave it on the page. So currently, this is the circuit that we have. We currently have a circuit where you have the voltage of our source combined with LRC series, right? So we have LRC. Order, of course, doesn't matter. Just whatever. That's our current circuit, right? And this circuit has a power factor that's equal to this, right? But we can manipulate this because currently XL is, equal, is greater than XC, right? So if we could increase XC somehow, then we could maybe make XC equal to XL, which would lead to a power factor that was equal to one, right? So how would we do that? Well, when you add capacitors in series, let's see what happens. So what I wanna do here is say, I'm going to add one extra thing to my circuit. I'm still gonna have my inductor. I'm still gonna have my resistor and those two aren't gonna change. And I'm also still going to have the original capacitor right here. But what we're going to do is, we'll put it in a different color, we're going to add into our circuit, in series with the circuit, another capacitor. And that capacitor is going to have a capacitance that we're going to call C prime. And hopefully, by adding that capacitor into the circuit, we can increase XC. What happens to capacitance when you put two capacitors in parallel? Or you just add them together? No. You, you, one over. you have to yeah, add the inverses. Okay. What's going to happen to the total capacitance when I do that? Is it going to get smaller or bigger? When it actually gets smaller. It's going to get smaller. Now, is that good? We wanted XC to get bigger. I think it is because really, this is our relationship, right? So if we make C smaller, what happens to XC? It gets bigger, right? It gets bigger, yeah. So that's exactly what we want to do. If, we, if our goal was to make it XC smaller, we would have to add capacitors in parallel. Very easy to do though, right? So I find this really fascinating of a problem. 
where all you're trying to do is just we want to set this thing equal to one and we know the way we need to do that is basically just make this quantity bigger and we say how do we do that well i need to make the capacitance smaller and you think back way back to when we learned about capacitors you say how do we make capacitance smaller oh yeah if i put two capacitors in series that will actually decrease it you think it would increase capacitance but it actually decreases the capacitance when you do that um and that's exactly what we need to do here okay so let's do that so the question is what does c prime need to be right let's let's phrase the question uh, can i just move all this work somewhere else is that okay with you all so i can well that's fine actually we'll just do this we'll just take this guy and we'll cut it and move it down here because really i just want that circuit okay nothing happened paste. it's just it's just gone oh no we're we're gonna go into a loading screen to paste how about we just undo we'll just can I move it? Will it let me do that? Mm, please? Is it because like, you have like, a lot of ink on the page, maybe? Yeah, it doesn't like it when... Um, OneNote doesn't like it when you get um, too much stuff. Anyway. Okay, so we want to figure out what C' prime needs to be. Now, in part B, it says that what we want to do is find the capacitance of the series capacitor will result in a power factor of unity. What does unity mean? I find sometimes people don't know what that means. PF, we said was power factor, and we said that it was equal to cosine phi. We're gonna have a do phi, I'll call it phi prime, and we wanna make this equal to one, basically. That's our goal. Power factor of unity. But what was the power factor? The power factor was equal to XL minus XC divided by R. And we are going to be manipulating this by throwing this in here. That's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be throwing this extra xc prime in here, and really we want to calculate what is c prime equal to. So uh, let's do this. So basically this equation is going to tell us that r is equal to xl minus xc minus xc prime. And we know what r is, but I don't think we know what l is, right? We have a frequency, we're given an average power, and we're given a voltage, but we don't know anything about the inductance or the capacitance in our circuit, right? We don't know anything about the inductance or the capacitance in our circuit. But if we did, what we could do is we could say R minus XL minus XC is equal to the negative of xc prime and then we can manipulate this so that we could have basically xl minus xc minus r should be equal to xc prime now we don't know what either one of these are we don't know what the capacitance is and we don't know what the inductance is right but from the first part we actually knew what the power factor was right in the first part our cosine phi was equal to 0.56 right and that was equal to XL minus XC divided by the resistance of our circuit, which we just found, right? So if I multiplied the R over here, R times 0 0.56 should be equal to XL minus XC. Which, even though we don't know what the inductance and the capacitance are currently, this tells us what this quantity right here is, right? So, if we put this into here, I'm starting to see some issues with negative signs. I think I must have made a mistake somewhere. We'll go back and fix that. Hey, Professor? Yeah, what's, what's up? You, so, cosine phi is XL minus XC over R? Yeah. Okay. Right? Isn't, wasn't it the tangent of oh, phi? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. sorry. Oh, boy. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. This is this is R over Z. Okay. Oops. Do I need to start over? I should start over. This is confusing. And any any attempt I make to try to fix this is going to cause all sorts of problems. Do we know impedance? We can find impedance, right? Okay. Yeah. 
We're trying to set this equal to one, right? Okay, what did we, the information we had from before though, this is still relevant. Cosine phi is supposed to be equal to r over z. That you'll agree with, right? Which means we can find z. The z is gonna be equal to r over cosine phi. So if we use our value for r, which is 20.6 ohms, and divide by cosine phi, which is 0 0.56 from the first part, then we get, um, Thirty-six point eight. That is what our impedance z is. Okay. Is, imp is impedance constant for all the interaction, or would it change? Because we want to make the cosine. Yeah, it's gonna change. It's gonna change. Yeah, it's definitely gonna change. I was just trying to see what we could actually calculate with this stuff. This maybe is not useful here. Okay. So we want to make this equal to one, and when this is equal to one, that basically means that XL has to be equal to XC, right? That's what's gonna happen in order for that to work. Yeah. yeah. Now, in order for that to work in our case, we had this original capacitor XC, and we're basically trying to add something to it, right, in order to make this work. So now we basically need XL to be equal to XC plus XC prime. All right. So how do we go about doing this? So if we write down what, um, and this, this, this will only work like this because this means if cosine phi is equal to one, that means that um, phi prime is equal to zero, right? And if phi prime is equal to zero, that only happens when XL is equal to XC, basically. Okay. So once again, we're kind of in this problem where um, we can solve for XC prime. It's basically gonna have to be equal to XL minus XC. But the problem is we didn't really know what this was to begin with, because we didn't have the inductance and the capacitance in our problem. So, um, in order to figure out what this quantity needs to be, what we could do is we could come back here and say, well, if I know what cosine phi is, then I also technically know what tangent phi is, right? And tan phi is equal to XL minus XC divided by R. So we can calculate, even though we don't know the inductance and the capacitance, we can calculate what XL minus XC is because it's gonna be equal to R tan phi. And tan phi is basically gonna be r times the tangent of, look at this, the um, arc cosine of r over z. Or the arc cosine of, well, phi, which we already know, because in this case, that's equal to 0.56. So this is x minus xc, and I think this is basically all you have to do to get the answer. Because now if we do the tangent of the arc cosine of 0.56, you multiply that times r, which was 20.6. I got 30 point, 30.5 out of this. Do you all agree with that? Did what I do, did what I just did here make sense? Yep. Okay. So we just figured out what XL minus XC was. And from this equation over here, what I said was that phi prime is equal to zero. That's our goal. Our goal is to put another capacitor in here that's gonna make cosine phi equal to one, which is automatically gonna make phi prime equal to zero. And phi prime is only gonna be equal to zero if XL is equal to XC plus XC prime, the two that we've added inside of here. Um, and so we get XL minus XC is equal to XC prime. And now we can actually find the capacitance because this is one over our, our frequency, angular frequency, multiplied by C prime. Our goal is to find C prime. So C prime is gonna be one over omega times XL minus XC. So C prime is gonna be equal to one over, I think omega was 100 pi. Yeah.
multiplied by XL minus XC, which we just calculated right here, was 30.5 ohms. So C prime is equal to 30.5. I got 1.04 times 10 to the negative fourth. I agree. So 1.04 times 10 to the minus four farads, which would be about 104 microfarads. So this would be the size of the capacitor that if you add it into the system like this, um, that you're gonna get a power factor of unity. Sorry, I uh, started off on the wrong foot there. Solving these is kind of tricky, and this is not the only method that you need to use to do this. I've definitely solved this problem in less steps before. Um, I just got a little bit confused, kind of toward the end of class today, and I need to eat lunch, but um, that's pretty much it. Hopefully, with what we covered today, you should be able to do all the homework problems pretty easily. Uh, this chapter is definitely not too challenging. You'll definitely see problems like this that will be kind of challenging. Um, and of course, it might start off as challenging when you're doing the homework, but you'll eventually you'll get used to it and you'll figure it out. So that is all I have for today. Does anyone have any questions about what we just did in this last problem? Hopefully it'll make more sense uh, when you're actually trying to solve it yourself. So you can always come back and watch the video. Okay, we're going to stop there today. The second hour was very long. Sorry about that. But we got started kind of a little bit late, so that's fine, I think. All right, well, I'll see you all next time when we'll talk about electromagnetic radiation.